be ready to play webinar in association with UPMC. This evening's session is titled Concussion and Return to Play. We are joined this evening by Dr. Michael Collins, who is a director of UPMC Sports Medicine Concussion Programme. We are also joined by Dr. Anthony Contos, who is a professor in the University of Pittsburgh and is their research director of Sports Medicine Concussion Programme. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Michael Collins. Thank you very much for the introduction, James. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this, this morning here in the United States and talking about concussion. Uh, this is a topic that we've learned a tremendous amount over the past five or 10 years, even longer. Uh, and there's a lot of new knowledge about this injury that I'm hoping to share with you this morning and to get you up to speed more on this, on this injury. Uh, my name is Mickey Collins. I'm, I'm a director of the UPMC Sports Concussion Program here in Pittsburgh, uh, of the Pennsylvania, the United States. Um, I do want to disclose before starting this lecture that uh, Anthony Contos and I have a couple of uh, disclosures, none of which have to do with this lecture this morning, but it's appropriate to, to let you know we are authors of a book and we have several grants from, from different uh, granting institutions here in the United States. So we do a lot of research and there's a lot of grant support for our work. Okay, the objectives of the lecture uh, really is, I, I wanna get into the basics of concussion uh, and talk about what causes a concussion and what actually happens in the brain when we have a concussion and to, and to also educate you that we're starting to learn that there's different types of concussions. There's different symptoms for these different types of injuries. And we actually are coming up now with targeted treatments for those different types of concussions. And these treatments are very active and very targeted. And I'll, I'll talk about that. And then I'm gonna hand this uh, lecture over to Anthony Contos, who's our head researcher here at UPMC. And he's gonna be showing you some data on, on return to play, uh, the effects of playing through an injury uh, and some of the risk factors associated with concussion. So let's get right into it and talk about what actually causes a concussion. Um, this is a little complex, but just bear with me. So the word concussus literally translates from Latin to English to mean to shake violently. And think about your brain as an egg yolk inside an eggshell. And when the egg yolk moves inside the shell, we have billions of cells in our brain called neurons. And each neuron is connected by an axon. What causes a concussion is when the brain shifts or moves inside the skull, um, the membrane to the neuron will stretch. And there's this little chemical called potassium, which is supposed to be inside the neuron. And when that membrane stretches, potassium will leak out into the extracellular space. And what that does is it increases the demand for glucose or energy. So the release of potassium out of the cell increases the demand for energy within the neuron. At the same time that there's what we call an efflux of potassium, there's this little cal uh, chemical called calcium, which is supposed to be outside the cell, that guess what, that, that will leak inside the cell and it shouldn't. But when calcium leaks inside the cell, the blood vessels will actually constrict and we get less blood flow to the brain at the very time that the brain's demanding more energy due to the release of potassium. And so all concussion is, is this release of, pota of, of potassium, an influx of calcium that causes this, this, what we call a metabolic crisis or an energy crisis to the cell. Importantly with concussion, there's no blood, there's no swelling, there's really no tissue damage or there's no structural damage to the brain. And that's why CT scans and MRIs and PET scans and all the things we look at uh, are normal. And rather concussion is this energy problem to the cell and neuron. In this energy problem, when it does happen and the brain is in this energy crisis, there's one very important thing that needs to be considered. You do not wanna be hit in the head again when this energy problem happens because the effects of the injury will be, will be magnified. And in some cases it can result in catastrophic injury. And so this energy problem leaves the athlete in a very vulnerable state to secondary trauma if there is a concussive injury. Now the problem, and I'll get into this a little bit, is that this injury can be, you know, generally invisible a lot of times, you know, because obviously there's nothing on imaging that you'll see. And we have to really rely on a clinical evaluation to determine if a patient has a concussion or not. And it's super important that you have a good understanding of what the signs and symptoms of the injury are 
so you can take the athlete out of play. Because if you allow this athlete to play through this energy problem, you're going to hear from Anthony here that the outcomes are much longer. And in some cases, we can have actually have very significant catastrophic outcomes and something called second impact syndrome, which is very dangerous uh, can act and actually can, can be catastrophic. So when in doubt, sit them out is, is, the, is the mantra here and to be very careful with this injury. Um, just to show you some videos of in your sport uh, of, uh, of concussion, uh, you know, think about, again, think of when you see this, this video here, think about the brain as an angular inside an eggshell and think about the brain moving inside the, inside the skull. And that's what sets off this cascade of events. And here's another event. Um, I thought I saw this video. I thought it was a good example of a concussive injury that we see. And you'll see that that athlete did not see the hit coming, was struck in the back of the head. And we actually find posterior blows of the head uh, are more likely to result in loss of consciousness. And we actually find that to be a very vulnerable part, a ver very vulnerable bi biomechanical trauma, the back of the head stuff. Now you can get obviously concussed from side of the head blows or frontal, frontal blows, but that posterior blow to the ground or, or, or head to head to the back of the head um, can really cause a lot of issues that we see with this injury. Now, it's very important to be aware of the different signs and symptoms of concussion uh, because this injury can be so subtle. Now, we look at this injury in both what's called signs of concussion and symptoms of concussion. Signs of concussion means what you will actually observe in an athlete, and you don't necessarily have to rely on self-report. And if you have any athlete that can't, that is confused, uh, dazed, has that empty look, uh, clutches his head, can't recall events prior to the hit or fall or is repeating himself or herself after head trauma, that is a, a, an immediate sign they should be removed from play. Um, if the patient is hit in the head or even not hit in the head and stands up and is ataxic or clumsy or has balance issues, that's immediate removal. If patients are answering questions slowly, if they even briefly lose consciousness, if they have any type of motor response, which is called posturing, um, any of these signs or symptoms uh, is an immediate removal from play. Patients that vomit uh, and any uh, you know, abnormal irritability, behavioral mood changes, all of those signs of injury can indicate that energy crisis has happened. And these are definite indications of brain trauma. And one thing that's that's very important to understand is that only 10% of athletes or less have a loss of consciousness. And defining loss of consciousness, that means your eyes are closed, you're not moving, and you're unresponsive, as you saw in that last video clip. Um, it, obviously, loss of consciousness is, is, is immediate removal from play, but these other signs and symptoms are also immediate removal from play. It's very important to be this, be aware of the subtleties of this injury. And if you have any of these signs signs of injury, they need to be removed from play. And, and keep in mind that you don't actually have to hit your head to have this happen. If you have an acceleration, deceleration type of, type of injury, while it even striking the head, the brain can shift inside the skull and set off that cascade of neurological changes that results in, in, in these issues. And again, the, there's a lot of vulnerability here when the patients are going through this injury. Now, to me, even complicate things more, uh, everyone, most patients don't show signs of concussion, the ones I just listed. Rather, what they'll report are symptoms of injury. And this is what the athlete is feeling. And the most common symptoms of concussion um, is are vision changes, seeing black in your, in your vision, spots, dots, light, co lights, colors, um, having a headache or pressure in the head, even if it's mild, uh, feeling sick to your stomach or nauseous, uh, balance issues, uh, what we call photosensitivity and phonophobia is light sensitivity, noise sensitivity, uh, any type of uh, disturbed vision changes, uh, constant, they feel foggy. Uh, probably the most common symptom we see actually is a sense of fogginess. And the way I would define that is the patient will say they feel one step behind, detached, removed, disassociated, slower, 
uh, always ask that question of patients. And there's a system in the brain called the vestibular system that's very commonly affected by a concussion. And when that system decompensates from that energy problem, they'll report that foggy kind of one step behind feeling. Uh, they'll also may report some anxiety, some emotionality, uh, and just not feeling right. Uh, if you if a patient has head trauma uh, or, or even a significant blow in the field, taking them off the field and asking of these symptoms is, is critically important uh, to understanding if there's a concussive injury. And, and one thing I want to share with you is that, again, we talk about loss of consciousness being only occurring in 10% of athletes. Did you know that on-field dizziness is, is up to six times more predictive of poor outcome following head injury than is losing consciousness. Dizziness is the most important uh, on-field predictor of severity of injury. So any reported dizziness, you're six times more likely to take a month or longer to recover from concussion. Very important to understand that. The symptom that's most predictive of, of outcome at three days post-injury is that sense of fogginess or feeling one step behind, detached, removed, disassociated. Again, that's the, the vestibular system that decompensates that produces both of those symptoms. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Be aware of the subtleties of this injury. When in doubt, sit them out. Make sure you do a thorough evaluation. Ask about these symptoms. Be aware of the signs of the injury and be aware of the vulnerabilities that you have when you're dealing with this injury. It's critically important. Okay, we've now started to identify that there's different types of concussions. In fact, we've now identified really five different types of concussive injuries. And again, now that you know concussion is this energy problem, um, once that energy problem happens, different systems in the brain can decompensate from that energy crisis. Um, and we now have an evidence-based uh, agreement across our field of studying concussions that we now know concussions involve different subtypes or different clinical profiles or different phenotypes of injury. The five different types of concussions are migraine, cognitive uh, concerns or issues, which is your thinking, vestibular dysfunction. Um, the vestibular system is a part of the brain that allows us to stabilize our vision, we move our head, allows us to interpret motion. It allows us to be in busy environments like grocery stores and, and car rides. Uh, it allows us to sensory integrate like lights and noises and busy environments. That system is a system, a lot of people don't, don't even know we have, have that system, but when it's injured, it doesn't feel right. You'll feel that foggy, dizzy, kind of slow, wavy, dizziness feel. Uh, the fourth type of concussion is ocular, which is your eyes working together as a team. And the fifth type of concussion is mood issues. And, and we also know there's modifiers of sleep problems and neck problems that can, can modify the effects of injury as well. But those five different types of concussions, there's different symptoms within each of those circles. There's different risk factors. Uh, and most importantly, there's different treatments. Um, we've actually now, now know that you treat each type of concussion a little differently. And we actually have physical therapies and, and different treatments for these different uh, types of concussions. And if you have a certain type of concussion, you may have a, a real totally different approach to treatment than a different type of concussion. Um, and you'll see here that, that we've really now identified different ways to treat these different problems of injury. Um, for example, again, I keep talking about the vestibular type of concussion because it's actually very common. When that system decompensates, again, patients will feel dizzy, foggy. They won't like being in grocery stores and shopping centers and car rides and, and ex dynamic exercise will cause them to feel that these, this weird feeling of dizziness and headache and fatigue and nausea. When that system decompensates, do you know that the only way to treat that problem is by retraining it? Rest is actually something that you don't want to do. Like if you have someone nap with a vestibular problem after an injury, uh, let's say if you know you want him to have a consistent pattern of sleep, you know, go to bed same time, wake up same time. But if patients are napping in the middle of the day, et cetera, when they have a vestibular problem, it can actually lead to migraine. And so one circle can lead to another circle if you're not careful in how you manage this stuff. But if you look at these different circles, we don't actually use rest a lot in treating those different problems. Um, now with migraine, some exercise is really good, but if you overdo it, it can be problematic. So the bottom line is here is, is it's an educational thing here. 
just be aware uh, as parents and coaches that there's different types of concussions. And when these injuries happen, remove them from play and get them to a specialist. Uh, we now have very good trained clinicians to that know how to identify these different types of concussions and how to make sure they get the right treatments for those problems that they have. And we're now doing research which shows that if you treat this injury right away, the outcomes can be so much faster and better and we can get kids back to play much sooner. You're gonna hear data from that from Anthony in a few slides here. It's critical when there's an injury and, and you see these signs and symptoms, take them out of play and then make sure they get to the right clinician for evaluation and treatment. And that's the way it should be done. But I just wanted to educate you that there's different types of injuries and, and we've made so much progress in terms of how to treat and manage this injury and get kids back to play safely. And by the way, there's a lot of misinformation out there. If you manage this injury properly, we do not see effects down the road from our patients and, and, and we're not big believers. Uh, mismanaged concussion can lead to problems. If you manage this injury effectively, uh, kids can go back to sports safely you got to make sure they're recovered from the injury, but they can go back to sports safely. And we, and we really believe strongly that you can mitigate any potential for long-term problems by treating this injury properly when it happens. And I'm the biggest proponent of sport and getting kids back to the sports they love. Uh, we're not going to overhype this injury, overplay it, because some of that is definitely going on. But make sure it's managed properly when it happens. We now have tools to assess this injury in a very sensitive, specific, and valid way. I'm not gonna get into the weeds on this, but you need, I want you all to know that there's tools that diagnose this injury effectively. We've created a physical exam. It's, it's like a five minute exam called the VOMS, which stands for vestibular ocular motor screening, where we can actually do an exam that, that identifies concussion up to 92, 93% sensitivity and accuracy. Uh, and that's an on-field exam. Um, and we're teaching that exam to a lot of clinicians over in Ireland. And that will probably get, get uh, spilled down to you guys at some point. Um, but we've also, uh, here at UPMC, we've also uh, developed a tool called IMPACT. Uh, that's a 20, 25 minute battery of tests on a computer. That's an in-office part of the exam. And that test is FDA approved here in the United States as a high degree degree of sensitivity and specificity and helping to, to assess this and diagnose this injury. Um, and impact is now being utilized across sports in Ireland, uh, which is really cool. And that's the test where we do baseline testing and then post-injury testing. Um, I just wanted you to know that there's really effective tools out there. So when you see this injury on field, take them out of play, get them to the right clinician. The clinician can use these tools they can identify whether concussions occurred, but then also identify what type of concussion and get the patient in the right treatment pro protocol, the right physical therapies, and then get them back to you for safe return to play. Um, that's the way to proceed. One thing I want to educate you on is that concussion fights dirty. Um, if you think of this injury as an energy problem, which it is, um, what you bring to the table actually will predict what type of concussion you have. Um, for example, and we've done research on all these things. So for each of these different types of concussions, the five different types, vestibular, ocular, cognitive, migraine, and anxiety, certain risk factors predict patients who will go down that pathway. For example, if you have a history of motion sickness or car sickness, you're much more likely to have vestibular dysfunction after head injury, after concussion. Because concussion is an energy problem and you have a weaker vestibular system, that system's gonna decompensate more likely in you than it is me who doesn't have that history. Um, so for example, if you have a child that has a history of car sickness and there's an injury, you can pretty well predict that the patient's gonna have vestibular dysfunction as, as their primary type of concussion. If you have a history of lazy eye or strabismus, you're much more likely to have oculomotor deficits following concussion. If you have a history of learning disability, you're more likely to have cognitive issues. If you have a history of migraine, you're more likely to have migraine. And if you have a history of anxiety, you're more likely to be anxious. Uh, again, uh, it, it, this injury hits you where it hurts. Um, it, there's different pathways this injury goes down and these different risk factors predict those pathways. So it's important to know that information uh, in your children and, and your players uh, and then let the clinicians know uh, because it really can predict how we treat this injury when it does happen. I thought that you might find that very interesting. 
we've also done research at looking at how often these different types of concussions occur. And believe it or not, the most common type of concussion is anxiety. 28% um, uh, of patients, their primary profile after head injury will be anxiety. One thing I did want to share with you too that I'm not sure I made clear earlier is that you don't only have to have one type of concussion. You can have all six of these problems or you can have two of these problems. These, these, these injuries can, these types of concussions can overlap. They often do, uh, but anxiety is the most likely to be your primary profile. The second most common type of concussion is migraine. Third is vestibular. Fourth is ocular and fifth is cognitive. Uh, again, I thought you might find that interesting. Many of you may not be aware that at UPMC, uh, we've, we've had the largest program in the world for concussion. We have about 20,000 patients come through our program every year. Um, we see patients from all over the world come here for treatment um, and evaluation. Uh, we consult with a lot of different teams across the, the United States, but we've now uh, expanded our program to Ireland and we've created a program called the UPMC Concussion Network where we've now trained a number of Irish clinicians, our treatment model. And we have clinics now around your beautiful country uh, in various locations. And that program is actually building. We're training more clinicians in, in the coming months. Um, but each of these clinicians you see on the slide here are, are excellent. And, and, and they've spent uh, several weeks, they've spent a couple weeks at least in Pittsburgh following me in clinic. We've taught them everything about our model. Uh, we've been over to Ireland uh, numerous, numerous times. Uh, my favorite trip of the year, by the way. Uh, it's, the, the name implies Michael Collins. Um, I have Irish roots, uh, actually in County Cork. Um, but, you know, we've trained each of these clinicians to understand our model and how to employ our treatments as well. Um, every Friday, we have case conference uh, where each of these clinicians you see uh, we join in a call for an hour and go over the cases in Ireland, and it's just been a phenomenal uh, expansion of our program, and I entrust uh, you're getting exceptional care by these clinicians over in Ireland. So uh, look that up, uh, and you'll see that you have a referral sources that you can use that you know they're going to get excellent treatment with the model that you just heard about this morning. All right, with that, I am going to uh, leave it to Anthony to talk about research. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to state that I, I kept thinking about as I was lecturing that I failed to mention, and that is with the on-field signs and symptoms. If you have patients that have the worst headache they've ever reported, a seizure, extended loss of consciousness, extensive confusion or amnesia, um, uh, except, you know, repetitive vomiting, make sure you take those patients to the emergency room because sometimes there can be a bleed in the brain that is well beyond concussion and that can be catastrophic as well. So I failed to mention that when I was talking about signs and symptoms. So I just want to make sure I mentioned that before I handed it off to Anthony. Uh, again, thank you very much for the time this, this morning here in the United States. I uh, hope you guys are surviving and doing well over in Ireland. And uh, 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 again, we're very excited to work with you with, with your country uh, and you, the UPMC Concussion Program is, is, is doing a great job over there and we're excited to be a part of it. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Anthony. Take care. Thanks, Mickey. Uh, we're now going to talk about some of the evidence behind the model and the information Dr. Collins provided to you. And the first thing we're going to look at is recovery. There's kind of this misconception that every athlete is going to take a certain amount of time to recover after a concussion. Uh, some people argue that most people recover in seven to 10 days. Others think it's around 21 days. And, and some think, especially like for kids and, and younger athletes that they might take about a, a month on average to recover. And it may be true when we look at the average, um, but when we look at individual patients or athletes, uh, we have to consider risk factors in recovery. And that will really drive a lot of the story. So we're gonna look at that today from an empirical perspective. So what does the evidence say about that? So the, the question really driving this for us is if athletes have more risk factors, does that result in a longer recovery? And when we say risk factors, we're talking about things that they bring to the table, such as their age. We know that adolescents, for example, over adults and younger kids tend to be at greater risk for this injury and its effects. Also females are reported to be more likely to have uh, more severe injuries, more symptoms uh, following concussion. And there are also factors including concussion history and migraine history that have been 
uh, you know, reported to be associated with a longer recovery, but also the things that happen after the injury, a drive recovery. So, you know, does having a loss of consciousness matter? Uh, does having amnesia at the time of injury matter? And if you have more severe symptoms or a higher symptom score early on, like you have headache, you have dizziness, you have balance problems, you have memory problems, all these different things, does that sort of symptom load mean you're going to take longer to recover? And then finally, do, do migraine symptoms? Because we've reported several times in the past that if you have headache with nausea, so upset stomach, and also light and noise sensitivity, uh, those athletes tend to do worse with this injury. And so if you have multiples of these, does that mean you're going to take longer to recovery? In other words, is there kind of like an add-on effect with each risk factor? So we did a study of 316 athletes here in the United States that were 12 to 23 years old, and they all had a sport-related concussion. And what we did is we looked at them at the first week, within the first week of injury, and then followed them at regular intervals every few days to determine if they were uh, cleared, if they were recovered. And, and that was based on current consensus guidelines. And we looked at factors that I just mentioned, such as age, gender, et cetera, as well as things like their symptom burden and post-traumatic migraine symptoms. And what we wanted to look at is how those were associated with recovery time. And what we found was, was striking. There are really three groups of athletes. Uh, a low risk group, a moderate risk group, and a high risk group. And a low risk group essentially meant you had none of those risk factors I just mentioned. A moderate risk group meant you had one or two, and a high risk group meant you had three or more. And what we found is the more risk factors you had, the longer it took to recover. And a long recovery we looked at in this study was 21 days or longer. What we found with, with athletes who had no risk factors is 97% of those athletes were recovered within the first 21 days. That, that's amazing, right? So if you basically bring nothing to the table, this injury has much more limited impact on you. In contrast, as soon as you add one or two risk factors, so let's say maybe you're a female and you have a migraine history. Well, now all of a sudden, uh, it's, it's, it's a third of those athletes are taking much longer to recover. Only 65% are recovered within 21 days. So we kind of lose a third right there. By the time we get up to three or more of these factors, so let's imagine an adolescent, female with a high symptom burden, for example. Now that athlete is 70% is of those athletes are not going to be recovered within 21 days compared to if they had no risk factors, it would be only 3%. So again, the take home message here, the more risk factors you have, the longer it takes to recover. One of the risk factors that wasn't included in that previous study, but that plays a huge role and we've published several papers in this area, is that if you continue to play following an injury, um, is that going to result in longer recovery and more pronounced symptoms? And, and this is important because this is something we can control through better awareness. So if you know or think you know you have an, a concussion or you see another teammate uh, or one of your athletes, if you're a coach that has this injury or might have this injury, it's important that they get evaluated and looked at for any suspected injury because we believe that if they continue to play, uh, that may have some adverse effects downstream. So, so really the problem is, is that the current culture of concussion in sport um, here in the United States still, in spite of education and other efforts, and I imagine in Ireland as well, is that athletes will tend to hide it, uh, ignore it, you know, minimize it. And sometimes there's just a lack of awareness. Like, I didn't know that was a concussion. I know from my own experiences as a soccer player, uh, playing football, that essentially, uh, you know, when I had an injury, I would do my best to play through it. And that's what a lot of athletes continue to do. In fact, 44% of athletes in a study report that they would continue to play in spite of having symptoms that they knew could be a concussion. So we really wanted to answer the question if athletes continue to play following their concussion or what they think might be a concussion, does that really make things worse? So we did a study with 130 athletes, age 11 to 19 years, and we really were focused on if they continued to play, so yes or no, and then how long they continued to play. And this was based on reports from physios or athletic trainers, as they're called here in the United States, and others on the sidelines, and also self-report. And what we found is that, you know, 52 were removed immediately, uh, but 24 continued to play for less than 15 minutes, and 32 played for greater than 15 minutes, so, so quite a, a large exposure after a suspected injury. And we also wanted to look at the recovery time. So were they recovered at 30 days, and how long did they take to recover overall? And what we found, again, was, was quite striking. Athletes who continued to play took twice as long to recover. So if they were removed immediately, they only took about 21 to 22 days on average to recover. 
if they continued to play, that doubles out to 44 days. And athletes that continued to play following a concussion were nine times more likely to have a recovery of 21 days or longer. So again, you know, continuing to play is a big issue here. And when you look at how long they continue to play, on average, the athletes that continue to play played for about 25 minutes. So we presented these data to American football coaches here in, in Western Pennsylvania in the United States. And, and the first question we got was, well, so what you just sounded like you said, sir, is that if they continue to play a little bit, they'd be all right. And, and I looked at this coach and I said, well, you know, I can't really answer that. We don't have the data. And, and of course, was, was pretty frustrated not to be able to come back to that coach and say, yeah, if they play even just for a little bit, that could be problematic. So my thought then was, why don't we re-examine the data and expand the study and, and see what we can learn about if they play just for a few minutes, does that matter? Or do they actually have to play for maybe 20 minutes or 25 minutes before there's any ill effects? And so we really wanted to look at this uh, from a data perspective. And what we found is the longer you continue to play, the longer it takes you to cover. So there's kind of an additional effect with each amount of time that you add on. So if they're removed right away, and this is again, a larger sample here, uh, it takes them just under 20 days. So 19 days on average to recover is what we would expect. In contrast, when you compare that to someone who played three to 15 minutes, now they're taking nearly a month. So you've added 10 or more days to your recovery and you're now about five and a half times more likely to take 21 days or more compared to someone who was removed immediately. But when we look all the way out to greater than 15 minutes, now we're all the way out to that 44.1 days and 12 times more likely to have a recovery of 21 days or greater. So again, there's an increasing effect with the amount of time you play. It's important to note that none of the uh, athletes were observed or reported less than three minutes continuing to play. And, and that's why the categories are three to 15 and, and greater than 15. So there's really no amount of time to continue to play that is safe, that will not exacerbate or make your concussion worse. So really, we think of it this way, and this is a good analogy that, that, that the coaches um, really understood. You know, it's better to sit out now for a week or two and then get back to play uh, using all those management and treatment techniques that Dr. Collins mentioned earlier, than to keep playing even for a few minutes and then risk sitting out for a month or longer, you know, and miss your whole hurling season or a big chunk of it, or maybe, uh, you know, your camogie season or, or, or football or what have you. You know, it's better to just sit out and take some time out and rehab the brain just like you would for a sprained ankle. So lastly, I want to talk about the importance of getting care early following this injury. So, so there continues to be a gap in concussion care here in the United States as well as in Ireland. These data here are related to what we see in the United States, and I'll talk in a moment on the next slide about what we see in Ireland, but nearly 60% of athletes do not seek care following an initial diagnosis of a concussion. So a physio or a physician says, hey, you have a concussion, and then that's the end of it. They don't do anything beyond that. They just, you know, maybe rest on their own, figure it out, and, and hope it gets better. And we see many of these athletes back in our office that you can see there on the right because they don't get better. And in fact, 2.2 million athletes in the United States are not receiving care following their injury as a result of this. And that results in about 600,000 developing post-concussion symptoms, which means symptoms that are lasting a month or even longer, sometimes out to three months or maybe even a year or longer. In Ireland, what we learned from a study in 2018 was that one in four adults aged 18 to 24 report having had a concussion, um, but 60% report no awareness of the injury. So they don't really understand those signs and symptoms and how to manage it, uh, all that information that Dr. Collins presented earlier. And this leads to kind of the biggest problem, which is about 30%. So one in three uh, individuals in Ireland, athletes with a concussion, did not seek any care for their injuries. So they're kind of just left uh, to deal with it themselves. So this all leads to the question, if athletes receive care sooner, do they actually recover faster? Or does it really matter if they come in sooner for care? So we did a study of 174 athletes, 12 to 22 years of age. And we, and we really looked at two things whether they came in early, so within the first week of injury, or whether they waited greater than a week, so eight to 20 days in this case, to come in to seek care. And then we looked at recovery time. Were they recovered per consensus criteria um, at 30 days, or were they still uh, continuing to have symptoms or impairments or really still concussed? And we looked at a bunch of factors in addition to when they came into clinical care, including age, gender, concussion history, their symptoms, 
uh, cognitive scores after their injury, vestibular ocular motor screening, and many other factors. And what we found was that later clinical care was the strongest predictor of a longer recovery. Both it and migraine history were associated with individuals or athletes who took longer than 30 days to recover, but the number of days to first clinic visit was by far the strongest predictor, and it was a better predictor than their initial symptom burden or severity, other risk factors, or their medical history. And in fact, athletes seeking care late, so eight to 20 days compared to those who sought care within the first week, were six times more likely to take a month or longer to recover than those seen within seven days. And the actual injuries that these athletes had were, were similar. There wasn't a group that had more or less severe injuries. So we know this is more associated with getting in and seeking care and then having that care provided such that they get on a pathway to recovery. So if athletes seek care sooner, they're gonna have an earlier return to sport, school and work. So less missed days from those activities. They're gonna reduce the potential negative effects of rest. And we know from research that uh, aside from rest in the first really 24 to 48 hours, prolonged rest is detrimental and can have adverse effects for athletes. And we want more active treatments, which involve seeking care and getting expert advice in that area. And we also know that if you, you come in sooner, you're gonna limit the healthcare and insurance costs associated with this injury and the number of patient visits that you're gonna have to have as an athlete and time away from your sport. So in summary today, some key points from our discussion on concussion. Uh, first, athletes should be aware of the signs and symptoms of concussion. They also really need to be aware of the subtypes and profiles because each of those can have different effects uh, and, and really require different treatments. So concussions are treatable using active targeted interventions based on whether or not they have migraine or vestibular, ocular, cognitive, or anxiety-like symptoms. And it's really important that you seek care early to get that best care as soon as possible to get you yourself or your athletes on the road to recovery as fast as possible. However, there are certain risk factors that certainly can affect and, and really result in longer recovery. Uh, everything from being an adolescent and female to having a higher symptom burden, or most importantly, the one that we can control, uh, continuing to play. And so we know that if the athletes get out sooner, um, they're going to reduce the amount of time it takes them to recover. So that's important for coaches and athletes and also for parents and others to recognize and to get kids out or adults out when they're playing so that we can limit uh, their recovery. Finally, athletes that receive care earlier recover faster. And, and the good news there in Ireland is that we have a growing concussion network with specialists that Dr. Collins alluded to earlier that can really help athletes get on a pathway to recovery. So uh, we don't do all of this work uh, by ourselves, the two of us. There are many people behind us, clinicians and our faculty here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in the Sports Medicine Concussion Program, as well as in the Concussion Research Lab that I direct. And we have also our clinical neuropsychology fellows who do a lot of the real hard legwork and, and groundwork for this injury. So uh, thank you. And uh, I wanna, uh, again, thank James for the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of myself and Dr. Collins. And I would also like to encourage you for more information to uh, seek out uh, the website for the UPMC Concussion Network there in Ireland. There you see the address there, www.upmc.ie slash upmc dash concussion dash network uh, and then backslash. And again, uh, thank you for the time today and I wish you all the best with your seasons. Thank you for that, Anthony. And a big thank you to Dr. Anthony Contos and Dr. Mickey Collins uh, for that very informative uh, session. So that concludes this evening's session. If you'd like to keep an eye out on the GEA, LGFA and Camogie social media pages for our next upcoming um, webinar, which is translating an analysis to the pitch. And that session is going to be delivered by Colm Clear and Kevin McGuigan on the 16th of August. So again, keep an eye out on social media pages um, for the Be Ready to Play series in association with UPMC. Thank you.